everyone, and welcome to another episode of Money Matters with Doug Jones, the personal finance show designed to help you move forward financially. Well, it's February, Valentine's Day is coming up, and that seems like the ideal opportunity to talk about relationships and money. Specifically, we'll ask questions such as, are you open and honest with your partner about your financial situation? Are you hiding anything? If you were hiding anything, would it affect your, financial, your relationship and your finances? Next question is, if you started living together, do you have a joint bank account? Should you have a joint bank account? And these are the, the things that I think we should explore in this episode. And joining us today, we have Wallace Howitt. Now, Wallace is a chartered professional accountant, and he's the author of a book entitled Love and Money, Conversations to Have Before You Get Married. Wallace, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Doug. Okay, so I'd like to start right into the meat and sort of potatoes of this stuff. And the first question is, I find that money is a sort of almost a taboo subject. It's something that people just don't seem to want to talk about. And is, is that always, you know, how do you have an open conversation if you don't actually even want to start the conversation? So can you tell us your experience as to like, why don't people want to open up about money? Doug, I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the first is it, 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 we are almost imbued with the view that it's an off the reservation conversation. In fact, there are all kinds of studies that suggest that we are more inclined to talk about sexual intimacy, religious affiliation, and politics than we are about money. And I think in part, that's because we're afraid of being judged or in some cases, exploited. I also think in the mix is, I, I don't know how to do it. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things that I, I saw in, in doing some research is I saw there was an article last year, and uh, it was about relationships and money. And in this article, they actually said, in order to have sort of a healthy and a long-term relationship, of course, you needed the sort of the romantic chemistry. But beyond that, it was like 85% said you needed to have financial compatibility. It even went on to say that 62% of, of people said that a person's financial situation could be a deal breaker in starting that relationship. So what are your thoughts on that? Because, because clearly financial compatibility is something that people are saying is important in a relationship. And if you don't ever wanna talk about it, then how do you understand if you have financial uh, compatibility? Well, that dilemma is what led me to write to write the book, Doug. Uh, years ago, I read a study a long time ago that suggested that 40% of Canadian marriages would end in separation and divorce. And I accepted that fact. The question I had when I read that fact was, why? And the most commonly offered answer was around finances. And I found that really interesting. Why is it that Canadian couples can't talk about money? In fact, its importance is, can be stated in two sentences. You know, when, in marriage, marriage, as we all know, is rich in hope and commitment to the future. But that future relies on the building of an understanding of each other and using that understanding to work together. Right. And if you can't talk about money, then how are you going to how are you going to secure this relationship and not be in that 40 percent? And, right. and as, as I talked to people over the years, what became evident was that most Canadians don't really know that consciously their own attitudes and values around money and often don't evaluate their behaviors. So if, if you don't know your values, your attitudes around money, and thereby assess your behavior, how are you going to understand your partners if they are in the same shoes? And if you, if you enter a marriage with this void, mm -hmm. how are you going to be successful? So I think that's... That's a pretty good uh, point that we need people to try to understand. So I guess the question is, how do you start that money talk? Like, 
you know, you don't phone up someone for a first date and say, by the way, you know, we're both accountants. So bring your P&L with you and your financial statements so I can look at your assets and liabilities. Uh, that's not going to, you're not going to probably will get that first date. So how do you start it? How do you introduce that? Well, I, I, I agree with you. You know, uh, Martha, would you like a glass of wine? And by the way, while I'm getting it, could you uh, just scribble down your credit score? That's a problem. You know, <laughs> there's no second date there. Exactly. Uh, I, I, think, I think the answer is slowly. Although, um, they, while discussions around money tend to hinge on life events, uh, we're moving in together or we've been living together and we're getting married. But they can begin in much more subtle ways. So you mentioned first date. So uh, it could, I can envision a conversation where uh, couples had a lovely dinner, first date, and the young woman turns to her date and says, so how are we paying for this? Mm -hmm. Which which speaks to her own sense of financial independence around uh, I can I can contribute to this, and uh, a balanced uh, undertaking here is important to me. Uh, I've had a lovely evening, but I want to own part of the the cost of the evening. So it can begin in very very subtle ways, and sometimes quite early. It c- it could begin before we move in. Maybe we're planning a trip, right? And um, so we're we're going to go off to Italy lovely romantic trip and values start to surface so are we flying business class are we flying at the back of the bus Mm -hmm. are we staying in a large international hotel or are we staying in luigi's b&b around the corner from the museum just off the main square and so values start to surface as we do things together and then I would think that would bring in some, w- your conversation would expand as you did that. So then if you're going to, okay, we're going to plan this trip and this is how we've decided uh, how much money we're going to spend in total. Well, if we're playing it together, are we sharing it 50, 50? Does one party make more than the other party? So there should be a reflection of earning ability. Um, so I think that the, as you start having those conversations, it'll start to help bring out more of the discussion. Absolutely. In fact, um, there is often an issue where one makes more than the other, and how do we reconcile that? And it becomes really important in marriage about it's not just what we spend, but it's what we earn, and how are we going to share expenses? There's no right answer. The right process is to talk about it openly. Right. And, And What that starts to surface, again, what that surfaces, is each stands back and communicates their values and behaviors around money. Now, as the relationship gets more intimate, more close, then you've got to try and surface them explicitly. I mean, a lot of our attitudes, values, and behaviors around money we absorb almost through osmosis from our families. Right. And because, and while we have, uh, take them up through almost a process of osmosis, doesn't mean they're not real. What it means is they operate just below the surface. And we often react to money issues almost automatically. Automatic is a bit of a strong word, but almost automatically. Most people, most days, do not assess their values and attitudes when they pull out a credit card. Uh, So from what I'm hearing from that is your sort of advice is to watch for the cues. There is no sort of right or wrong time. They can come in as time moves on and to watch for the cues and start picking up on them to start getting the discussion going. Um, yeah. Were you yes. surprised at the survey saying that um, 62% of people would sort of say, uh, I would call off a relationship if the other person's uh, financial values weren't the same as mine or their financial situation was, uh, I- I'm going to say bruised because as a trustee, I use that a lot. Uh, I- I- I'm not surprised. I-, I-, I tend to take surveys as indicative as opposed to their 
discrete number. Uh, but in terms of the that direction, uh, I, I take no exception with that. In fact, uh, I would say that finances can be a deal breaker. Uh, you know, it's one thing if your partner, your intended partner says, I have $30,000 of debt and stops. It's another thing. If that partner says, I have $30,000 of debts, and this is how I'm working to pay them off. Those are two very different individuals. Absolutely. Very yeah. different individuals. Yeah, I um, I have kids, and they're of that age. And I, I'm, I personally, I'm trying to explain that to them, that, you know, if someone you're dating says, well, I've accumulated 200000 in student loan debt, that might be a sign that there's a challenge coming down the road. Um, so... That kind of raises to me my next question is, are there red herrings or flags that people should be looking for that sort of say, oh, that's something I should really think about? Uh, big credit card debt. Yep. Uh, a lifestyle or a desired lifestyle that doesn't seem to fit the income that you think would go with your intended partner's job. So it's any form of dissonance. It can be expenditures relative to uh, job uh, prospects. Yep. Uh, uh, an almost uh, abandon uh, around spending. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sign I like best is, is if you're intended goes through the mail on Friday, opens them all, and the last one gets left unopened and pours a glass of wine. And you can always tell what a credit card, they, they always come in the same kinds of envelopes. Yeah. That's that. That's this month's credit card. That means that that person of the view is, is in denial. This is right. too hard to do. I'll have a glass of wine. And maybe I'll deal with it on Monday. So anything that strikes you as as, as having some dissonance or friction, I, I think is 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 not a deal breaker, but it's it's a reason for question, and that's why I often suggest to people, particularly before marriage, maybe not when moving in, but certainly before marriage, that you have an explicit conversation about attitudes, beliefs, values, and behaviors around money, and in the book. Uh, I make I, I offer several suggestions about how to do that and how to have that conversation. Not only what to talk about, but how to talk about. It. Because, as I say, I learned 30 years ago that it was the inability to talk about money. I will never forget. Uh, uh, I was in Calgary. Uh, I was asked uh, by one of the big financial houses to go out and share some thoughts around tax and investments. And as always, I had a, I have a question, a formal question period. But I always stay after to answer questions from folks who did not want to ask in the broader forum. Last woman, that particular evening, she had a difficult question about investment and tax. But she allowed in the course of that conversation that she was in a very difficult divorce. And she said something very important to me. She said, every time we try to talk about money, it degenerates into an argument and then into sullen silence. That, I think so, that's a common belief that I, I see all the time. I, um, you know, I see people that, that want to hide their finances from their significant other all the time. So um, I, we're going to do the break right now. And when we come back from the break, what I'd like to do is continue our discussion and then get into things like joint bank accounts. So we'll see everyone right after the break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Everybody knows not to drink and drive, but some people still think it's okay to take drugs and drive. Police have the authority, the ability, and the tools to determine if drivers are impaired by legal or illegal drugs. And because drug-impaired drivers can pose just as great a risk as drunk drivers, they face the same penalties, like the loss of their driver's license, a criminal record, fines, and more. A message from the RCMP, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, and Arrive Alive Drive Sober. 
What kind of show do you want to see on Rogers TV? What interests you? Log on to rogerstv.com, fill out a show proposal, and tell us about your segment idea. We want to know what you want to see. Rogers TV, only on Rogers. Welcome back to Money Matters with Doug Jones. So before the break, we were talking about um, your finances and how open you are with your uh, significant other and whether or not you had full disclosure and did you have you um, had the money, I'm gonna call it the money talk. And our guest today is Wallace Howick, um, a CPA and author of a book, Love and Marriage uh, Conversations, uh, uh, sorry, Love and Money Conversations to Have Before You Get Married. And so we, were, we went through a lot of information on sort of how to start that talk with your significant other, start introducing financial concepts and um, we had some great advice. And what I'd like to sort of explore now is, um, how frequently should we have these money talks? The survey that I referenced earlier said that 77% of the participants believed you should have a money talk once a month. Now I'm assuming that's meaning that they were getting fairly serious in the relationship and had probably moved in together or were married. But is once a month enough? Wallace, what's your thinking on that? Um, it's what works for you. It, it's not what I think works. It's what works for you. And that depends on the quality and the caliber of your start, of your start point. Right. Like, have you had a conversation about a budget? <laughs> have you come to some sort of exchange around a compromise about how are we going to spend money? Uh, so, the frequency of the follow-up discussions depends on how well you've gathered information. Like when you think about it, financial planning is a four-step process. Household finance is a four-step process. Where are we now? So did you get out the credit cards? See where the money's going. And there's, there's a hard truth here. The hard truth is your take-home pay is the only hard fact. Everything else is choice. Everything else is choice. So where's the money going? Where do we want to be? Do, do we have some sense of goals? Like we want to get this these bills paid off. We want to save for a house. So where are we going? How do we get from here to there? And then the most, in some ways, the most important step, which is to your point, checking back in. How are we doing? So if you've had that conversation, and you have a budget, then that influences uh, how often you're going to sit down and talk about money. Uh, because to some degree, you don't have to talk every month. If you've sorted out our lifestyle, the choices we're going to make around saving and spending, uh, so that they can be less frequent. If you're in a tight place, one of you's lost your job, or you haven't had the kinds of conversations I just suggested, you're going to be talking a lot more frequently. In fact, the frequency with which you're talking may reflect your financial stability, actually. Right. And to me, the frequency is also triggered by um, a life event. So if yes. you built the budget and you were both working, you both had jobs and one of you lost your job or we had an echo, you know, get a, we got a pandemic where you got put on CERB. Those are life events that affect that budget because, as you said, the constant your income and living within the means is the below part. So then you got to go back and readjust it. So to me, yes. the life events is important. That's the feedback loop I was talking about, right. the fourth step. How are we doing? Uh, and just to your example, what becomes really important is talk to your creditors. Don't wait for the problem to boil over. If there's an issue, face it, resist denial, face it, and contact your creditors Correct. Uh, rather than have people knocking at the door. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in my sort of, I call it my day job, <clears throat> uh, I'm a trustee. So I, I teach budgeting to people all the time, and I am trying to help people get through those financial challenges on talking to your creditors, negotiating agreements with them, and 100% agree. The sooner you talk to them and explain the situation, the better it's going to be. But again, the starting point is where are we today? We get them to track for three months all their expenses. So we got a benchmark to start figuring out the budget on. So I, I do think that that's a pretty important one. 
Okay, so the next thing I'm going to bring up is you're in a long-term relationship. You've just moved in together. You've got married. Question all the time, joint bank accounts. And it has a lot of people all over the map. Yes, we should do it because we're together. No, we want to maintain our own independent bank accounts. We'll set up a joint account that we'll transfer money into to pay the bills. What's your thinking on that? Um, well, there's no right way. The right. right way is how you process what you think is right for you. But there's some good, there's some good alternatives. Now, one alternative is um, Mark and Michelle each put have their pays put into their own individual accounts and in the agreed proportion as a result of their earlier conversations, they feed a common bank account and the utilities bill, the mortgage, the rent, the car are all paid from that account. That's one alternative. Uh, I see with increasing frequency, they each have their own accounts and one simply transfers to the other and that person becomes the, the family banker. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're 50 or over, you probably recognize the model. Uh, both pays go into the same common account and the bills get paid from there. Um, I have two cautions, though, around which one you think works best for you. I think two things are really important. Everyone should have an element of financial independence. And what do I mean by that? Two things. But let's assume you take the first choice. Our pays go into each of our separate bank accounts. Two things should happen. There should be an agreement that three, $300 a month uh, I get as an allowance. Each of us, no questions asked, no explanations offered. Second, uh, there should be some withdrawal for a, a, a regular savings program, even if it's just 50 bucks or a hundred. You know, stand, what you don't get, you don't miss. That, that, that is so true, 100%. that there's real truth in our grandmother's adages. The last thing is uh, it's important for each to have their own credit card. In your audience, I'm sure there will be women who are baby boomers who remember the days when not only did they not have a bank account, they didn't have a credit card and they didn't have a credit rating. Right. Or so it's important my, to preserve that. Day, she actually tells the story of when um, she was in her 20s and went to purchase a car and couldn't purchase a car without her father's approval because she wasn't married at the time. You know, I, I'm with you. You need to have that financial independence because life events can happen. You can be married and your spouse becomes deceased or you get a breakdown. And if only one of you has done the finances and only one of you has a credit score, the one who doesn't could be in a real jam. So I'm 100% with you. That's a very imperative part of it. And I, and, I, and I think those conversations should be revisited periodically. Like, how's it working? Oh, well, this isn't working for whatever reason. Okay, well, let's try this. The important thing is not to allow, uh, it's not working to fester into something much larger. But this is also, to go back to a point you made earlier, Doug, which is a really important point about you have to be honest with each other. You know, you can't come into this relationship with debt and not share that very important fact with your intended partner. 100%. Because, because it'll, you'll have abused trust. Trust, you know, the old adage about trust. Trust is like a bank account. Build slowly, one withdrawal can wipe it out. And as the discussions I've tried to have is if you enter a relationship together and one of you has no debt and one of you has a very significant amount of debt, as you try to do that budget and your life plan together and you're, we want to buy a house, we want to qualify for a mortgage, that issue is going to raise its head and it could cause problems in your relationship because that massive debt is going to be an impediment to qualifying for the mortgage and cash flowing it. So these are all really important things that I think people need to talk about as they try to move forward. And to circle back to a, an earlier point you made, and that is about sharing the current expenses. So the issue can often revolve around, well, why does Mark have this much debt? Answer, 
he went to graduate school. So that's going to raise his income. So maybe we make an allocation temporarily till Mark gets that loan paid off, and then we revisit how we share expenses. Uh, in fact, in the book, that they, I actually have, Mark and Michelle, have that conversation. One of the most important things about this book to me was not only that it be short and useful, but that it not be, not be me talking to the reader. Right. So I chose the literary platform of a fictional young couple having a conversation with me and allowing the, the issues and the challenges that I've heard all of my professional life surface through that conversation. And they, in the end, they decided to split it evenly, despite the income gap. And and again, they came, they were well informed. They came to a decision together, and I think that helps build their overall relationship. So, your book would be very valuable read to a lot of people. Um, I would say, particularly the younger people who are getting married, or maybe if you're later in life and doing a second marriage. So. Can you tell us how people can get in touch with you and obtain a copy of your book? Uh, you can reach me uh, at Wallace Howick at wallacehowick.com, W-A-L-L-A-C-E-H-O-W-I-C-K at wallacehowick.com. Uh, the book is available through Amazon, your local bookstores. Uh, I'm delighted at how many independent bookstores are carrying the book. And of course, the big the big bookstores like Indigo and Chapters. Okay, so let's give the name again so everyone remembers. So the author is Wallace Howick. The book is Love and Money, Conversations to Have Before You Get Married. So if you're going to go look for it online or in a bookstore, you've, you've got the title. Um, and so I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today, Wallace. Your insights were fantastic. I hope they help people as they're uh, opening up more as their relationships expand. And I'd like to thank the viewers for joining us today. If you have any questions about today's show or comments or even suggestions for a future show, you can email us, go to the Rogers TV uh, show site, click on the link and you can send us an email. And until uh, next show, thanks everyone. I'm Doug Jones and goodbye. And thanks again, Wallace. Thank you for having me, Doug. Bye now. <laughs>